And I have to acknowledge our uh, recipient for this year, David Sedlak. David, welcome and congratulations. I had to mention David because he's going to introduce our keynote speaker. So one of the things I just want to end up with before we go on to the first presentation is what, what we're seeing out there is NWRI. We're working on a lot of projects with agencies in the Southwest on a lot of potable reuse. And we've really turned the corner on indirect potable reuse. So we have the groundwater replenishment system, which is expanding to 100 million gallons uh, a day. That's going to be up and running next year. Uh, but you see cities like San Diego, Los Angeles, uh, Santa Clara Valley Water District, which serves Silicon Valley, Tucson, El Paso. These are agencies that we work with on this topic, and we've really turned a corner, and we know what we're doing. So that's great. The technology's there. Um, we do have work to do whenever we do these projects in terms of public acceptance, but we know that, and we're much better at that. We're talking a lot about direct poll to reuse now. Uh, I'm not going to go into it. We actually have a presentation later this morning on this. And that's where a lot of these challenges are. So we're removing the environmental barrier. We have to understand that the treatment performance uh, has to be there for this type of application. We need to understand the monitoring that we need for these types of projects. Uh, we're, going to we're looking at more stormwater reuse out there. We're not as far along, but I think we're going to see a lot of things there. But my, what I want to get across is that's what this conference is about, is to try to talk about some of the tools, whether they're technologies or approaches, and thinking about how we're going to think about uh, urban water sustainability uh, now that we're in the 21st century. So uh, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, David Sedlak, who's going to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, David is uh, at UC Berkeley. He's a co-director of the Water Center. He's deputy director of reinventing the, urbans, uh, the nation's urban water infrastructure, Renew It, which is an NF center with Berkeley and Stanford and others. Uh, David serves on one of our NWRI panels with the state looking at DPR, uh, so we put him to work on that. And just yesterday, he was uh, named or will be the uh, editor-in-chief of the uh, environmental science technology as of January 1st, I believe. Is that right? So amazing what happens to you once you become a Clark Prize recipient, David. <laughs> David, thank you for being here. Thank you, Jeff. Good morning, everyone. Um, I was really, really happy when I won the Clark Prize, and not for the reason you may think, uh, but for the reason that I'd get another chance to come back and see a Clark Prize conference. Because being at a Clark Prize conference is like being at an all-star game. You see uh, the best and brightest speakers, and that's a real benefit. And it was even better when Jeff told me that there were some opportunities to invite some other people to give talks. And in particular, he gave me some say in uh, inviting our keynote speaker. And that brings me to Urs von Gunten. So um, I first met Urs von Gunten on September 18, 1992. And the reason I know that day is I, I can't even remember what day it was last week when I you know, gave my students an exam. But I remember that day because it was Easter Saturday. And Easter Saturday in Switzerland is a day when the stores are, getting, are open a half day and they're getting ready to close uh, for several days. And we had just arrived on Easter Thursday. And um, we would have starved to death if Urs had not taken us into his home and fed us. And so Urs has this tremendous ability. I mean, here was this guy fresh from his PhD at ETH in Zurich in, in organic chemistry and starting a postdoc at AVOG. And he took in a couple of foreigners and uh, looked after us and looked after us during our whole time when I was a postdoc in Switzerland. And he has this uh, tendency to take in strays and look after them because he's a very compassionate person. I learned a lot about Urs during that time and since then, and one of the things I've learned is that he's not looking for accolades, but accolades somehow find him, um, and they cling to him, just like I did when he took me backcountry skiing in Switzerland. Um, and he's collected a number of these accolades over the past few years. Um, a few of them include the Henry Rosen Award from the International Water Association, um, the Martin Schallenkamp Award from the IWA and the ESNT Excellent in Review Excellence in Review Award, and also the uh, associate editor on the longest sabbatical 
because someday he'll come back and be an associate editor at ESNT again. He's a full professor at EPFL in Switzerland, and he's also an active researcher at AVOG. He's been head of the chemistry group. He's been head of the, of the uh, drinking water and water resources group as well. Um, in addition to collecting accolades, Urs likes to climb peaks. And so sometimes he's climbing peaks in the Alps, and sometimes it's in the Himalayas, and sometimes it's in Patagonia. And sometimes he's climbing peaks that involve water that isn't frozen. And those peaks are really his great contributions to research. So if we had four or five hours, Urs could give us a series of seminars on his pioneering work on bromate formation in ozonation systems, uh, the concept of the ozone CT and the RCT, um, work on nitrosamines and their formation in ozonation systems, or work on the use of ferrate as a disinfectant and oxidant in drinking water systems. All of those have been seminal contributions to our understanding of uh, drinking water treatment and advanced oxidation processes. But when I thought about Urs as a possible speaker here, I thought of his contributions to urban water infrastructure and really uh, a new way of operating water infrastructure. And I think it's particularly pertinent for uh, people here in North America to see this European experience of integrating a new way of protecting water resources. That is, in Switzerland, you have, uh, they're basically at the upstream part of the Rhine River. They have many, many people living in a small area, and they engage in a fair amount of de facto water reuse. They also have great concern for the aquatic environment and the effect of effluent discharges on aquatic organisms. And so over a period of about 15 years, Urs and his colleagues at AVOG have studied the presence of trace organic contaminants in wastewater effluent, their effects on aquatic ecosystems, and probably more importantly, the engineered treatment systems that are necessary to remove those contaminants and protect ecosystems. And then what I think is really special about their work is they took it the next step, working with the Swiss government and utilities and uh, consulting companies, they took this technology and brought it into practice. And in, I guess it was about two years ago, uh, the whole country of Switzerland made decisions about different ways to treat their wastewater effluent to protect the aquatic environment and downstream drinking water treatment plants. And this idea is now catching on in Europe. It's being considered uh, in Germany and another, a lot of other parts of Central and Northern Europe to become the next generation of urban water infrastructure. And so I think it's very interesting to us in Southern California and the Western United States where a lot of discussion is being had about direct potable reuse and other forms of potable reuse systems to see the European experience. And I can think of no one better than Urs von Gunten to tell us about it. So Urs, please come on up and we look forward to your lecture. Yeah, thank you very much for this kind introduction. Uh, you have already almost covered the whole topic of my talk, so. <laughs> so I will talk about uh, this management of micropollutants in urban water cycle, <clears throat> and I will tell you a little bit about uh, what was going on in Switzerland. I also called my talk Wastewater 4.0. Uh, it has nothing to do with uh, David's recently published book. <clears throat> so if you look at the micropollutant problem in urban water management, uh, we have a lot of micropollutants that are registered. Uh, in the European Union, there are over 100,000 synthetic organic chemicals registered. About 30,000 of these chemicals, they are in uh, daily use. And, uh, we have uh, several applications of these uh, compounds in pesticides or chemicals as food supplements or in uh, human pharmaceuticals or also veterinary pharmaceuticals in personal care products, etc. There are also numerous natural compounds that are formed by processes in the environment also due to anthropogenic activities. If you have eutrophication of water bodies, you can form taste and other compounds, cyanotoxins, 
And at the same time, we also have a tremendous development in analytical chemistry. So it's no wonder that we find more and more of these compounds in wastewater, but also in uh, water resources and in drinking water. So this is one way to see it, uh, how these chemicals can get into the environment. Uh, you can, if you get some medicine from your doctor, you can take it, you will excrete them, sometimes in, as metabolites, uh, sometimes you don't take them, you put them directly into your toilet. And, uh, but recently I discovered an alternative way how chemicals can get into an environment. And you know, there's some poor guys like me who lose their hair. And uh, there was a report in a newspaper that some men actually put uh, some con contraceptive pills into their shampoo. And then sometimes it helps to ha get your hair back, but uh, it can also have uh, other consequences. And uh, you know, uh, you can lose part of your masculinity if you do things like that. So this is just one example what people actually do to uh, look better or so if you look at the urban water cycle, and this is of course also the urban micropollutant cycle and you know what kind of mitigation process we have, uh, we can start, uh, for example, in the water resources. I don't know, is there a point there? So if you start in the water resources, uh, you can have various sources of water like uh, river water, lake water, groundwater. And then uh, this water will get into your drinking water system. So many times you have a treatment, but it's also possible that you can take this untreated. In Switzerland, we have about 30% of the drinking water is not treated at all. It's going directly to the customers. And then it gets into the household. And basically what we do there is we transform the drinking water into wastewater. So we pollute the water, it gets into the wastewater treatment plant, and then, depending on where you are, it gets uh, into the ocean, it goes downstream to other countries, or it's recycled in your own system. So this is uh, called the indirect reuse. So it gets back into the water resources, and in these water resources we also have natural cleaning processes, we, of course we have dilution as well. There, there is some uh, contamination getting into the resources. We also have other sources of anthro anthropogenic activity, such as agriculture or also industrial activities, which can also pollute these water resources, and then it gets back into this water cycle again. Uh, there is also, of course, this uh, direct water reuse uh, this is, uh, in Europe, this is a little bit less the case. You know, in, in Switzerland, for example, we use, we use only 5% of the renewable water resources. So we have plenty of water, so direct water use is not a big issue. But this indirect reuse is, makes up uh, maybe about 30% of our drinking water in Switzerland. So now we have uh, several possibilities to get rid of micropollutants. We can do this in the drinking water plant, so then you basically protect your drinking water from uh, these pollutants. Then you can do it on a household level. You can do it at the wastewater. And of course, there are also some barriers that you have to put in for this direct reuse. And we have various technologies that can be used, uh, oxidation processes, adsorption processes with activated carbon, membrane processes, but also biological processes. So this is one example of uh, this uh, indirect reuse. Uh, there is a, a scheme that is used in the city of Basel. This is in the north of Switzerland. The uh, city has about 200,000 inhabitants, and they don't have enough uh, groundwater there. So what they do is they use Rhine River water they do some particle removal, then it's infiltrated here in, in the forest, pumped out, and then there is some activated carbon filtration uh, as an additional cleaning step. So what we did, we looked at the uh, micropollutants in this uh, system here. 
Uh, we had uh, more than 500 target compounds that were analyzed. And in the Rhine River, you find uh, more than 130 of these compounds. They come from different applications, like pharmaceuticals, pesticides, biocides, drugs, and uh, also perfluorinated compounds. So one can see that uh, in this first step here, until you infiltrate the water, there's not much change in these compounds. After the infiltration, when one pumps out the water, it is reduced to about a third of uh, the compounds. And then after the activated carbon uh, filtration, only about 10 compounds are found. And they're present in very low concentrations in the low nanogram per liter level. So one can see that uh, this uh, infiltration process uh, is already quite efficient for the cleaning, and then if you combine it with uh, an additional technology, you can get rid of most of these compounds. So this is the only case where I refer to drinking water. Now I will focus more on the wastewater side. So in Switzerland, we had uh, quite uh, some activities in assessing micropollutants in the urban water management. And uh, one of the main issues was really the environmental health. This was a main driver. And of course, the drinking water quality is also a decisive argument. If you can say, OK, we reduce the compounds in the aquatic environment, this will also have positive effects on the drinking water. The public perception is very important here. We had some issues with fish decline in rivers, and the public was really concerned about that. Then we have international obligations. We are the sort of the water castle in Europe. We have uh, the Rhine River that originates uh, from Switzerland. We have the Rhone River. We have the Ticino, and they all flow into our neighboring countries. So we have some responsibility in regard to that. And uh, there are several ways to uh, address these issues. One can avoid the discharge of them. So there are measures in agriculture to reduce the use of pesticides. There is also possibility of source control. So if a chemical doesn't, is not produced or not allowed, then it will also not get into the environment. Then uh, elimination of point sources is, of course, also an important issue. So if you can uh, eliminate the discharge of these compounds into, into the environment, and then, of course, we also come to issues such as cost-benefit. This is uh, an issue, but it's not really a big issue uh, because in Swiss politics, environmental issues are quite high on the agenda. And, uh, you know, tourism is a very important aspect of this. We would like to show people who visit Switzerland that it's in more or less intact environment. And uh, the willingness to pay for that is also quite high. There was a recent survey in Switzerland where the outcome was that people were willing to pay about 100 US dollars per person and year to protect the environment from micropollutants. So this is also quite uh, remarkable. So just a few, a little bit of information about the, the assessment of micropollutants uh, in Europe, but also in other countries. And I must say, most of these activities are concentrated in Switzerland and Germany for the moment. There is a competence center for micropollutant in Germany, in North Rhine-Westphalia. So they give a very good overview over what's going on in Switzerland. In Germany, they have some major projects that are dealing with these issues. There is a, a federal project on uh, risk management of emerging compounds. This is a 30 million project, Euro, uh, Euro project, uh, with about 90 research groups. There are some activities in North Rhine-Westphalia where they look at the uh, system of the Ruhr River. So this is, includes about uh, 5 million people who get uh, drinking water in this area. There are some activities in the Netherlands. So they uh, published uh, like uh, a new uh, report on the behavior and mitigation of pharmaceuticals in uh, drinking water and wastewater and drink, drinking water. 
Uh, then there is the International Commission for the Protection of the Rhine. This is also quite an important driver in this system. There are about 60 million people are living in the Rhine River catchment and they all get more or less their drinking water from the Rhine River and the wastewater contribution uh, can be up to about 20% in the Rhine River and of course the water quality deteriorates the further you get away from Switzerland to the Netherlands. In Australia these uh, uh, issues are more related to water recycling and uh, if I understand correctly in the US of course there are also a lot of activities in water recycling especially in these arid zones uh, in the West. So now I would like to briefly mention what kind of activities were ongoing in uh, Switzerland in the last about uh, 15 years or so. Uh, it all started in uh, 1998 with a project called Fishnet and this was uh, triggered by the observation of fishermen in Switzerland that the fish population declined in the rivers. So there was a big uh, national project going on. There was the uh, thought that you know this was just uh, caused by discharge of uh, wastewater but then they found out that it was much more complicated also related to the morphology of the rivers of the sediment transport in the rivers etc. So based on this project there was a national research program on endocrine disruptors so this was financed by the Swiss National Science Foundation and uh, basically they saw that the wastewater treatment plants are the major source of these endocrine disruptors and uh, that most of the problems occurred in uh, rivers where there was not a, a sufficient dilution of the wastewater effluents. The third uh, project uh, which uh, was running from uh, 2006 to 2011 was then even a more detailed assessment of the situation. So basically all the wastewater treatment plants were modeled and it was uh, assessed how much uh, micropollutants were discharged. And you see the sort of each dot here is a wastewater treatment plant and the red dots they show that there is actually a, a discharge of compounds above the uh, health uh, level of, um, of these micropollutants in the environment. So it could be shown that about 15% uh, of the population equivalents would discharge too many of these micropollutants to the, to the environment. There was then uh, an assessment concept to actually select substances and develop uh, water quality criteria and in the third part of this project there were measures uh, uh, technologies were investigated and finally this led to a selection of uh, possible technologies for enhanced uh, wastewater treatment. So this uh, Swiss strategy Micropole now recommends the upgrade of wastewater treatment plants to remove micropollutants and uh, basically one would like to have a 50% reduction of the load and I will show you afterwards what that means. Uh, this also basically from the research this went to politics. The Swiss parliament had to decide on this uh, especially because the uh, water pollution law had to be adapted to this. So this was decided this year in March that uh, the parliament wants to go ahead with it and uh, corresponding changes in the water pollution law were accepted and uh, it will get in force in 2016. So from then on the wastewater treatment plants will be um, obliged to actually do something but in order to reduce 50% of the load we do not have to upgrade all the wastewater treatment plants. Many of them are fairly small so it was decided to upgrade about 100 wastewater treatment plants over the next 20 years and of course uh, you know the most efficient wa uh, ones are the big ones so you can have a big effect with uh, a relatively small investment so all the wastewater treatment plants with more than 
100,000 person equivalents will be upgraded. And they are also the ones that mostly discharge into the Rhine River. So about 70% of Switzerland discharges into the Rhine River. So if you can uh, basically upgrade the wastewater treatment plants in this catchment, you can already improve the Rhine River quality quite tremendously. Then uh, it was also decided uh, to upgrade wastewater treatment plants discharging into rivers with high percentage of wastewater. So this was to protect the ecosystem. And then also wastewater treatment plants that are important or they, they discharge into rivers with uh, important riverbank filtration. So this was protection of the drinking water resources. So what about the treatment technologies? So the treatment options now are ozonation or powdered activated carbon. So these are the two technologies that came out of the technology assessment. The costs are about 1.3 billion uh, US dollars over the next 20 years. So this seems to be quite reasonable and the yearly costs are about 130 million dollars. And this um, boils down to 30, about 13 dollars per person and year. And this will be taxed on the wastewater. So when the tax starts uh, in 2016, this will open a fund and this fund will then be used to upgrade the wastewater treatment plants. And as soon as a uh, wastewater treatment plant has upgraded its operation, they don't have to pay the tax anymore. So then we basically distribute the whole cost over the whole population. It's not only the ones that are affected, they have to pay it's the whole population. So the cost of the wastewater treatment plants increased by 2 to 25 percent, really depending on the size of these plants and uh, the overall increase in the electricity co consumption. So this is not only for wastewater, but the overall increase will be 0.1%. And uh, they're trying to compensate this by additional biogas production, but also by installing photovoltaics on uh, these wastewater treatment plant uh, sites. So Basically, the wastewater treatment plants, they are free which technology they would like to choose. They can take either ozonation or powdered activated carbon. Uh, so if we compare the two technologies, uh, powdered activated carbon, of course, removes micropollutants, whereas ozone transforms these micropollutants. Uh, but ozonation also leads to a partial disinfection, which we don't have in, in uh, powdered activated carbon. You know, in Switzerland, uh, wastewater is not uh, disinfected uh, normally, but this would be an additional benefit. But then we also have to look at uh, toxicity. We might form some uh, byproducts. The energy requirements, they are more or less the same. In ozonation, you have more energy consumption on site, but if you take the overall energy consumption also for, the, for the production of powdered activated carbon, it comes uh, more or less out even. Uh, there are also some issues with handling of ozone versus powdered activated carbon. So it seems that the ozone technology is a little bit easier for the managers of wastewater treatment plants than powdered activated carbon. If you make a mistake there, then the whole plant will be black. And there's also some local circumstances, you know, how does the plant look like? Where can you retrofit? Uh, it, so this is also the, the uh, decision criteria and also the type of the wastewater. I will show you later on some results where we found that if you have a high industrial contribution, you can run into more problems with ozonation. So this is just a comparison of micropollutant removal by biological treatment, powdered activated carbon and ozonation. And, uh, there is uh, some data early on, uh, people also tried to look at the removal of micropollutants just in biological treatment. And we see that uh, if you have a nitrification process, uh, the removal increases somewhat, but you don't get to 
about the 80% uh, load removal that's needed for these 100 treatment plants to get an overall load reduction of about 50%. Then you can use powdered activated carbon. So basically it's just dose dependent. If you add more, you get better removal. But uh, there is also one possibility that you partially recycle your powdered activated carbon. So you basically dose it and part of the preloaded powdered activated carbon goes back into the biological treatment and so you can reduce the, the amount of or the concentration of powdered activated carbon needed. So with about 15 milligrams per liter of powdered activated carbon you can get uh, relatively good results above this 80% elimination. Then for ozone, you, it also depends on the dose. So we found that the specific ozone, those uh, grams of ozone per gram of DOC is a very good uh, comparative parameter. And we see that the 80% elimination can be reached with about 0.8 grams of ozone per gram of DOC. So one uh, important aspect of the whole thing is basically to see uh, what does it mean on the ecotoxicology? So these are some in vitro tests that we did uh, with uh, enriched uh, wastewater. So there is a whole bunch of tests uh, like bacterial tests with algae, then uh, also the estrogenic, uh, estrogenicity, then uh, some action of uh, pesticides, and then also genotoxicity. So overall, in these in vitro tests, we find uh, that there's always a re an improvement uh, of uh, treatment. Uh, this leads to an improvement in the uh, biological systems. The picture looks a little bit different if we look at in vivo systems. So there were a bunch of organisms were uh, tried from some uh, like insects, larvae, worms, then we have uh, like snails and mussels, then daphnia, some fish. And uh, we see that in certain cases after ozonation, there is a deterioration. So this is basically due to the oxidation of the organic matrix. You can form uh, aldehydes and ketones and some of these compounds can be more toxic to these organisms. But then uh, if you look at the whole picture after sand filtration, one sees that these effects go away again. So this is uh, then uh, the recommendation to always combine ozone with a biological filtration step to get rid of these kinds of compounds. With activated carbon, we get uh, quite similar pictures. So this was then also the decision to uh, go forward with both uh, technologies. So now I would like to show you a little bit of what we have done uh, in these ozonation systems, what kind of steps are necessary to actually test your systems. So when I started to work in the field, we just looked at kinetics. So we saw, okay, the compound is degraded and we were quite happy about this. But then some regulations in the European Union in regard to pesticides where also metabolites of pesticides are considered uh, as uh, problematic. We saw that we also have to look at degradation products. Uh, so we started to investigate these transformation products. Then, uh, as you all know, there is also oxidation byproducts. So these are compounds that are formed from the matrix. So we also have to consider that. And finally, we have to look at uh, biological effect, so does it actually lead to an improvement of the situation, or is it, uh, is it the same, or even do we form compounds that are more toxic than the target compound? So now I would like to guide you through some examples of these uh, four issues here. So in terms of the kinetics, we typically have uh, second order processes and if you look at the abatement of a micropollutant, this depends on this K value. This is a second order ray constant. So this is a physical chemical constant that can be determined for a molecule. And the 
oxidant concentration. So in order to assess how well a compound is degraded, we have to know both of these parameters. So for the oxidant uh, concentration, we have developed some tools to actually assess this in real systems. And uh, in regard to second order rate constants, there are values in the literature. We have about 500 values nowadays, so you can look it up in the literature. But then there is still, you know, if you are dealing with compound X, you might not have this value. So there is a possibility to measure this, but then you need a specialized laboratory to do that. Uh, there is also some quantitative structure activity relationships that we developed recently. And we also started to look into quantum chemical calculations. And we are now working on a tool that will be a web-based tool where people can put in structures of molecules. And then you can assess or uh, estimate the corresponding rate constants. So this is shown here. Here we have looked at various uh, organic uh, moieties in molecules, some aromatic moieties, some olefins, and some uh, amines. And uh, basically what you see here are plots of the second order ray constants versus some electronic parameters. So in, in the case of QSAR, we can use these hammer type uh, parameters. So you see one gets uh, relatively nice correlations. But then you have to know these uh, Hammett coefficients. And sometimes, if you have more complicated structures, it's not so easy to estimate this. So then we started to look into quantum chemical calculations, where we can basically estimate electronic levels of these molecules and also correlate them to these ray constants. And we see here in red that these correlations are also quite nice. And they are quite similar to the QSAR. So basically, this allows us now to optimize these processes. And we can estimate then these rate constants. And uh, we find also a good correlation between these QSAR and quantum chemical models. So these are shown here in blue. And uh, this uh, basically also allows us to uh, make these estimations without uh, knowing uh, these uh, Hammett or Taft uh, coefficients, which are sometimes not readily available, and they need uh, special skills to actually determine. So we are trying now to optimize this process. And in this model, we also try to optimize the prediction of uh, transformation products. So the product formation is an other issue. And uh, it's quite tedious to actually elucidate these kinds of mechanisms. Here I show you the example of the transformation of 17-alpha-etinyl estradiol. This is the active ingredient of the contraceptive pill. So ozone mostly attacks here on this phenol group, but there is a possibility of a secondary attack on, on this etinyl group. But most of the primary products, they will uh, result from the attack here. We can have a ring opening. We can have a hydroxylation, or then we can also have the formation of a benzoquinone type. So these compounds, they also have very high reactivity, so they will react further very quickly, whereas this compound will be more stable. So we look now into the degradation of this compound during ozonation. So here you have the concentration, the logarithm of the concentration against the ozone exposure. We see that the ethinyl estradiol concentration comes down very quickly, but then it sort of stops at uh, you know, an elimination of more than 99%. It stops and it goes further with a, a much slower rate. And uh, basically, if you look at the kinetics of this process, this can be explained by the attack on the phenol group, and this can be explained by the attack on the ethinyl group. And uh, we were quite puzzled by these results, but uh, we also looked at the ethinyl estradiol concentration, and we saw that actually this ethinyl estradiol concentration increases again as a function of the time if we just let sit these solutions after they have reacted. So what happens here is we have a, an attack of ozone on this molecule, and then we form this phenoxy radical. And this phenoxy radical can 
react with superoxide that is also present in these solutions. Superoxide can attack here, and this then leads back to the original compound by uh, the loss of uh, single oxygen. So a very small percentage, so it's less than 1% uh, of this molecule reacts by this pathway, and then uh, basically the attack on the ethanol group is then the decisive factor for the kinetics. So that's why we actually observe this biphasic behavior. Uh, we also measured uh, uh, the estrogenicity of the molecule, and you see the estrogenicity comes down really nicely in parallel to the elimination of this compound. So this means that uh, any attack on the molecule leads to a complete loss of the estrogenic activity. And this is, of course, uh, uh, very good news because we would like to get rid of this estrogenicity uh, as much as possible. So one other case that we investigated recently is the oxidation of quinoline. Uh, quinoline is uh, a compound that is on the can candidate, contaminant, can candidate contaminant list 3. So this is the structure of it. And if we look at the estrogenicity as a function of the elimination of this compound, we see that this compound is not estrogenic as itself, but it increases the estrogenicity to a certain level, and then if you have full degradation, this estrogenicity decreases again. So we saw that uh, if you have a, an attack of OH radicals on this molecule, you can form the 8-hydroxyquinoline compound, and this compound has certain estrogenicity. It's not very strong. It's about 30,000 30, times less potent than estradiol, but still you can have a estrogenicity. But you would need very high concentrations to actually uh, be of any importance. So this is uh, uh, just a case to show you that uh, if we have a, an oxidation, we can also, uh, this can also lead to compounds that have a completely different uh, behavior in terms of effect than the parent compound. But it's probably not very relevant because we would need very high concentrations of this compound. So, as I mentioned before, we also have to look into uh, disinfection or oxidation byproducts. So, what we did is we took water from several municipal wastewater treatment plants and we looked into the bromide concentrations and the bromate formation for a specific ozone dose of one gram of ozone per gram of DOC. So, to my astonishment, uh, we had uh, sometimes very high concentrations of bromide in this wastewater. So you can look at this water. It has 48 milligrams per liter of bromide, and this in Switzerland. We are not near the ocean somewhere. So this is uh, caused by uh, an industrial, an important industrial input into this uh, uh, municipal wastewater. So you can see that with the eye here. Uh, this means that there's an industrial input. So what we see is that the bromide levels, they can be in the order of uh, 100, 200, 300 milligrams per liter. And if we ozonate these waters, we of course also form uh, some bromate. So this here is the uh, drinking water standard at, 20, at 10 micrograms per liter, but we can get up to 20, 30 micrograms per liter in many of these wastewaters. If you consider the dilution of these wastewaters in the rivers, which is usually factor 20, then we would still go way below the drinking water standard, but we have to be careful about these issues. Another component um, is the formation of NDMA. So we see the NDMA in the uh, wastewater, then after ozonation and after, ozona uh, after ozonation and bio. A biological filtration. So we see here in this water, there's not really, in these two waters, there's not much change in the whole system. We see in this water, we form a lot of uh, uh, NDMA with ozonation, but in the biological post-treatment, uh, it decreases again quite dramatically. So here we also have an important contribution of uh, industrial wastewater. We selected these uh, wastewaters 
especially to have extreme cases, and this is also what we found here. So something that we were interested in recently is also the behavior of silver nanoparticles in wastewater treatment. It has been shown by some researchers at the AWAC that uh, these silver nanoparticles are uh, mostly transformed into silver sulfide, and then we were interested what happens if these silver sulfide particles get through an ozonation process afterwards. So what we see here is the oxidation of silver sulfide particles with ozone. Here we have the ozone dose, and here we have the release of uh, silver plus. So we see as a function of the ozone, we have a release of uh, silver plus, and basically in a wastewater uh, matrix, we would form uh, more or less quantitatively silver chloride. So what does it mean for the toxicity? So here we looked at the algal toxicity. So basically here you see the photosynthetic yield. If you use uh, as a function of the dose, if you use silver sulfide, you have no effect. But if you use these uh, silver sulfide particles after ozonation, then uh, the photosynthetic yield goes down. So this means we are actually back to a, uh, a compound that has some effect on organisms. But uh, we, uh, in our test systems where we looked at the effect on uh, photosynthetic activity after ozonation, we never saw a decrease of it. So I suppose the particles are probably in this range here, so they're probably, the concentration is probably too low to see an effect after ozonation. Another emerging issue that we are also studying currently is the fate of antibiotic resistance during wastewater ozonation. So here we actually did some tests on a full-scale plant. This is the first uh, full-scale plant uh, uh, that uses ozonation in Switzerland. It's in Dübendorf. There is probably a coincidence that is very close to Erwag. Uh, so we looked at the, uh, and at the bacterial counts, colony forming units after primary sedimentation, secondary sedimentation, and after ozonation. And uh, what you see is that the uh, plate counts go down. So for each step, we have a tremendous reduction in the plate count after prim primary sedimentation and secondary se sedimentation. And then after ozonation, uh, there is uh, also still maybe one to two lock uh, uh, reduction of the colony forming units. We also looked at the uh, plate counts for antibiotic resistant bacteria. And we see that uh, ozonation can uh, be quite uh, good for the removal of one kind of antibiotic resistant bacteria, but for another kind of antibiotic resistant bacteria, we, uh, we see almost no effect. And uh, some researchers in Germany, they uh, think that this is due to the fitness of these bacteria. They are used to more oxidative stress, and they would also resist uh, an oxidation, uh, chemical oxidation process better than some other organisms. So now to finish up, I would like to show you a recent development that we have uh, made. We developed an ozone test system. So this is basically to assess whether an ozonation can be a feasible process for a wastewater treatment plant, so for their decision. And we have uh, divided this into four modules that can be done in the laboratory. And actually this test system has been developed at the AWAC, but now is moved to practice. So private laboratories can do this test and uh, then give some consulting to the corresponding wastewater treatment plants. So in the first module, we look at the matrix effect on ozone stability and the formation of OH radicals. Then in the second module, we look at the elimination efficiency of micropollutants, because this is the main target. Then in the third module, we look at oxidation byproducts. And uh, in the fourth module, we look at uh, bioassays. And uh, this uh, can be do done in a modular way. So 
basically, if you know there is some kind of uh, unexpected behavior, then we have to do further tests, or this could also mean that dosonation is not the technology that can be applied. So I want to show you some results with that. It's quite a busy graph. We have tested seven different wastewater treatment plants. So up here you see basically the behavior in regard to ozone and OH radicals. Then here we see the formation of bromate and NDMA. And then we have the biological test system. So we have uh, tested uh, various uh, AIMS uh, tests. Then we have looked at uh, estrogenicity, est estrogenicity and androgenicity. Then we have looked at the uh, photosynthetic activity of algae, algal growth. We have done a Daphnia test and finally a fish egg test. So what you can see here is, uh, you know, already for the ozonation, the, the green means, okay, it's within the expected range. We have some waters that behave uh, completely differently. So, for example, in this water uh, where we have uh, an important contribution of industrial wastewater and landfill leachate, we see that uh, we have very low ozone exposures and very low OH radical exposures. So, for the elimination of micropollutants, this water already more or less falls out. Um, and so then for the other waters, yeah, we have a little bit uh, higher OH exposure, but this uh, can still be a, a good water because we then uh, would have a better elimination of micropollutants. Then for the bromate, we, as I showed you already, we have some waters that form like uh, in the order of uh, 30 micrograms per liter of bromate, but in this water where we had this 48 milligrams per liter of bromide, we formed almost 300 micrograms per liter of uh, bromate, which is of course very high. Then for NDMA, so in this uh, system we also looked uh, at, uh, this is the raw water one, two is the water after ozonation, three is the water after ozonation and some biological degradation. We just had a a batch system where we have a holding time of about a week to look at the degradation. And so we see, for example, here in this water we have high NDMA formation, but in this biological uh, degradation it disappears again, and this is sort of mimicking what we will have in, a, uh, in, a, in one of these uh, biological post-treatment systems. So for the biological test systems, we see that, uh, for example, for this water, we start out with uh, some red here, and after ozonation and biological treatment, it's green. So this is very good for this water, the same. And uh, for this water, yeah, here we have, for example, an increase here in this AIMS test. Uh, we are also in the red area for these other tests. And I don't want to go into all the details, but we see, for example, here in this water, uh, we are more or less in the red range for everything. So probably ozonation will not be a very good uh, uh, way to deal with this water uh, to, uh, to clean it. So then we came up with uh, sort of a scheme to evaluate it, so we think that these three waters, they would be okay to treat with ozone. We have some doubts with uh, these two waters, so probably some additional tests would have to be done. And then for these two waters, we think it's, uh, an ozonation would not be feasible. So this is now something that uh, uh, this test system will now be transferred to practice and they can decide if a wastewater treatment plant wants to look into a sanation, whether it's a feasible technology or not. So with that, I would like to come to the conclusions. Uh, we have uh, seen that uh, powdered activated carbon and ozone are technologies that can be applied for enhanced removal of uh, micropollutants at reasonable cost. Uh, however, for ozonation, we have to look a more, little bit more careful into the details. We have to look into the ozone stability, the kinetics of uh, ozone micropollutant reactions, uh, because there's no 
full mineralization of target compounds. We also have to look into toxicity. And uh, we have to develop this uh, the test system to actually assess whether inosination is a feasible technology. So with that, that I would like to acknowledge uh, quite a lot of people who were involved in these studies, but also a lot of funding agencies. And uh, my special thanks goes to David. <laughs> this is a, an older picture, as you can see, uh, shortly after we had met, uh, as he mentioned in 1992. This was 1995. And uh, I would like to thank him very much for all the inspiration and his very good friendship. And uh, we now look like this. <laughs> so 20 years later, I don't want to show a picture in another 20 years. But if, we, if you have ever wondered what actually the age factor means, then you see the example here. So thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, just from a practical point of view, where is the particulate at, or, uh, activated carbon going after the treatment process is over? You re recycling it or? No, the powdered activated carbon goes into the sludge and the sludge is incinerated in Switzerland. So it's burned, yeah. <laughs>